Is it possible? Or plausible? Or probable? Or certain? That within a period of only six years of the last decade of the 16th century 1593 to 1599, four history plays of the Kings Edward I, the second, third and fourth, were written by four outstanding poets and dramatists, George Peel, Christopher Marlowe, William Shakespeare, and Thomas Haywood, all printed and staged in London. Let us briefly reflect on these four plays and begin with Edward I play. The King Edward I play, with its long, three-parted title stories. First the famous chronicle of King Edward I, surnamed Edward Longshanks, with his return from the Holy Land. Second, also the life of Llewellyn, rebel in Wales. And third, lastly, the sinking of Queen Eleanor, who sunk at Charing Cross, and rose again at Potter's Hith, now named Queen Hith. Is a play, chronicling the career of Edward I of England. The first edition, quarter one, entered the stationer's register, October 8, 1593, four months after Marlowe's alleged death. The second quarto appeared in 1599, both quartos anonymously. From the Edward I play, it has been suspected, for a long time, that it was written by George Peel, because the back of the last page of quarto one contained a handwritten signature, George Peel. Amazingly, even though the authorship of Peel is by no means assured, today it is no longer doubted in any encyclopedia. Consider the following observation. Similar to the title page of Shakespeare's Opus 1, Venus and Adonis in 1593, the title page of the play of Edward I, in the same year, also contained the woodcut emblem of the Anchor of Hope. Their woodcut emblem of Edward I contained an additional inlay behind the Anchor of Hope, illustrating a male face and a skull, placed on a medieval Savonarola type of an X chair. Consider, that the title emblem, the Anchor of Hope, also on Shakespeare's Opus 2, Lucrece, in 1594, was stunningly altered, identical to the title emblem of Edward I play, in the same year, 1594, on an anonymous book of an English gentleman, entitled, The Second Report of Dr. John Faustus, containing his appearances, and the deeds of Wagner, written by an English gentleman, student in Wittenberg, and University of Germany in Saxony. The modified Anchor of Hope title emblem, clearly, must have a crucial meaning. It has something to do with the other subtitle, to fulfill the desire of all those, which desire novelties of the same gentleman. What may be the meaning of this additional dubious title information? Let's give a proposal. The author Marlowe, alias Faustus, fulfills the desire, to inform the reader, that he is still alive and that the play, Edward I was written by him. If the emblem would have been printed solely on the title page of the Faustus report, we primarily would have associated the strange emblem with the context of Marlowe's Faustus story, that is, Faustus' contract with the death. But in the context of the recent alleged death and final disappearance of Marlowe himself, only a month ago, we ambiguously are informed that he is living and that Edward I has been written by him. Since long, textual and contextual identities between contemporary authors and Shakespeare have created an endless debate and also moral qualms as to, who may have borrowed or stolen from whom. Such a debate also happened for many contextual and other arguments of the Edward plays, 1, 3 and 4 because of a compelling reason. Consider, that only the author of Edward II was not printed anonymously, he, alone, is clearly identifiable as Christopher Marlowe. Why not the authors of the Edward plays 1? 3 and 4. 
it must deeply surprise, why a more reasonable and logic cause, though difficult to imagine, has never been proposed, namely, that stunning textual and contextual identities together with incredible historical and literary coincidences can only be resolved with the help of the simple fact, that one, and the same author, Christopher Marlowe, still alive, wrote all four Edward plays. The anonymous plays, only centuries later, fatefully attributed to Peel, Shakespeare and Haywood, for a distressing lack of new and appropriate scientific hypotheses. It must give us pause for thought, if we read for instance. In Peel. Unhappy king, dishonored is thy stock. Hence feigned weeds, unfeigned is my grief. Compared to Marlowe. Hence feigned weeds, unfeigned are my woes. Or if we read in Peel and makes their weapons wound the senseless winds. Compared to Marlow. And make your strokes to wound the senseless light. A plausible and logic reason, why the Edward II play in 1594 is not anonymously, but bears the author's name, Creedot Marlowe on its title page, might be. That the play had been staged prior to Marlowe's disappearance and thus was publicly known to be written by, or associated with, him, this could not be kept secret, though the strongest contextual autobiographic Gaveston Marlowe correspondences were printed as, Piers Gaveston his life and death in 1594, already under a pseudonym of Drayton. Consider, it's likely that rumors, nowadays called fake news, had informed the educated upper classes, that Marlowe was no longer among the living, but murdered some month ago. For a long time there were principal arguments against Shakespeare's authorship of the play Edward III since it was not mentioned in Francis Mears' Palladis Tamia in 1598, and not included in the first folio in 1623. The play's displacement from the canon was explained due to a protest to William Cecil because of the play's virulent portrayal of the Scots in 1598. Meanwhile the play Edward III has been fully accepted as a Shakespeare play and included in the new Oxford Shakespeare complete works in the new Cambridge Shakespeare series, and both in the Riverside Shakespeare and Arden Shakespeare editions. This could be done, since comparison of text phrases in Edward III with Shakespeare's on its left little doubt, that they originated from the same author, the true Shakespeare. Listen to a few examples. Sonnet 94. Shakespeare. Lilies that fester, smell far worse than weeds. Edward III. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. Sonnet 142. Shakespeare. Or, if it do, not from those lips of thine. That have profaned, their scarlet ornaments. Edward III. His cheeks put on, their scarlet ornaments but no more like her oriental red. Stratfordian Shakespeare scholar, Professor Gary Taylor stated, that of all the non-canonical works, Edward III had the strongest claim to inclusion in the complete works. And Shakespeare scholar Eric Sams argued, that the play is entirely Shakespeare. Let's touch finally the two parts of the Elizabethan history play Edward IV, centering on the personal life of King Edward IV of England. The play was published anonymously in 1599, and has long since been attributed to the author Thomas Haywood, Shakespeare scholar Professor Forker, from Indiana University, early noticed, that Haywood derived whole scenes in Edward IV Part I and II from Shakespeare's early histories, such as Henry VI Part II, the Jack Cade scenes or Richard III. What has rarely been noticed, is, that after the Edward IV play, 
Haywood dramatized, as some sort of his next chronicles plays, the reigns of Queen Mary and Elizabeth, in two parts, dubiously entitled If You Know Not, Me, You Know, Nobody. What seems not to have been noticed at all, is the wordplay and its deeper meaning of the title phrase, If You Know Not Me, You Know, Nobody or the troubles of Queen Elizabeth. Especially in the context with the ambiguous term, nobody. Consider, that in this context, it definitely needs a comparative interpretation of a stunningly similar, but altered, evocative title line of a play written in the same year 1605, by Samuel Rowley, printed by the same printer. When you see, me, you know, me or the famous chronicle of King Henry VIII. Both obscure, seemingly autobiographic, title lines undoubtedly carry an ambiguous meaning, which can most plausibly only be decoded, if one accepts the Marlowe Shakespeare authorship thesis, which states, that the poet genius Marlowe, since June 1593, to save his life, had finally disappeared and was officially dead but in reality lived incognito, and wrote under a multiplicity of pen names, here in 1605 amongst others as Hayward and Rowley. What may it mean, that the two first title lines of two historical plays seem to mark the personal situation of two different authors in a similar but different way? Hayward, if you know not, me, you know, nobody. Rowley, when you see, me, you know, me. At first sight, the Hayward play title lines, if you know not me, may mean. If you do not know me, you know nobody else of literary importance or greatness, because it's all me. On a second level, the lines may mean, if you do not know, who I am, you should know. Officially I am dead, I am a no one a nobody, the logical negation of somebody. Or, if you know me, only as a reader or theatre-goer, you will not recognize me personally, but as a poet or dramatist. The title line of Rowley, when you see, me, you know, me, in a way is complementary to Haywood's line. The author tells us, that he is alive, and in case, you would see or meet him, of course you would recognize him. But since he hides himself, and is forced to do so, you won't have the opportunity to see and thus recognize him. He is invisible. He is a no one. A nobody. Consider, that scholars have noted common features, all links, between Rowley's play and the 1616 version, the B-text of Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. Since the diary of Philip Henslow records a payment to Rowley for additions to Dr. Faustus. This traces the author only as a plausible pseudonym of Marlowe. Why, up to now, Shakespeare Academe has made no reasonable attempts, to explain, who, beside Marlowe, might have had a motive, to enlarge and modify Marlowe's Dr. Faustus in 1616 so extensively. A reasonable explanation would have required the acceptance of a complex historical, factual conspiracy, by the feigning of Marlowe's death, ever since the cause of the Shakespeare authorship controversy. Notice, that in those early years of the 17th century, similarly to Haywood's play If No Not Me You Know Nobody, there existed a staggering contemporary literary use of, and dealing, with the term nobody, and somebody in dedications of plays and poems from several anonymous authors as well as from named authors such as John Davis, Nicholas Nemo, Ben Johnson, John Day, John Taylor and others. In his book, The Scourge of Folly, in 1610, the author John Davis in his satirical epigrams, 
in honor of noble and worthy persons of our land, praises in epigram 159 the famous English hyphenated sheikh, Spear, comparing him with the famous Roman playwright, Terence, and concludes, about the English Terence. You have no railing, but a reigning wit. And, honesty, you sowst, which they, do reap. So, to increase, their, stock, which, they, do keep. In plain language, this means, satirically, that he, Marlowe, alias the true Shakespeare, is not in a safe place, he cannot hold on to a railing, like others, he is equipped, however, with an outstanding brain. What he sows, others are reaping. To enhance, their, fame, which, they, do keep. Such as the King Edward play dramatist Peel, Shakespeare and Haywood. And in the immediately following, extremely short epigram 160, which is indispensably connected with the preceding epigram 159, the author satirically connects the famous English Terence, Shakespeare, as his second identity, with his most constant, though most unknown first identity, nobody, he assures him, twice, that he will be protected. You shall be served with naught. In plain language, the highly ambiguous epigrams disclose the English Terence, the hyphenated Shakespeare in epigram 159, represents the poet's second self, a pseudonymous identity, whereas the poet's first self, in epigram 160 marks the real identity of the same, alias Marlowe, who, for safety reasons, has to remain concealed, and must be protected under all circumstances, he must remain as a nobody. That's good for him, it alone protects him. Now, that you know epigrams 159 and 160, and their tight, inner connections between a hyphenated shake, spear, and a hyphenated no, body. Can anybody really believe, that the figure nobody has nothing to do with our national icon, English Terence, alias the true Shakespeare? And have these connections really nothing to do, with a contemporary authorship issue? Consider, that in 1606, contextually and chronologically, very closely related to the epigrams just mentioned, a highly sophisticated anonymous play, Nobody and Somebody, appeared. Seemingly close to a history play with, the true chronicle history of Elidure, censuring around a character, called No, Body. Just listen to a small section of a conversation between Nobody and his companion, the clown. Nobody. Come on. My own servant. Some news some news. What report have I in the country? How am I talked on in the city? And what fame bear I in the court? Clown. Oh. Master. You are half hanged. Nobody. Hanged? Why man? Clown. Because you have an ill name, a man had as good, almost serve no master, as serve you. I was carried afore the constable but yesterday, and they took me up for a stravagant, they asked me, whom I served, I told them, nobody, they presently drew me to the post, and they gave me the law of arms. Can anybody believe, that there is no, autobiographic reference in it? An anonymous, nobody? Inquiring about his own fame? Interested in the rumors about him? How London is talking about him? What fame he bears at court? Being informed that he is half hanged? Because he has an ill name. In plain language, half hanged means he is living. But as a half dead, his identity and name have been extinguished, 
thus he was made a non-person, a nobody. His fame, however, could be preserved under ill names, such as Peel, Shakespeare, Hayward and so many others. Who, in 1604, may have been the anonymous author of news from Gravesend, sent to nobody. From textual parallels alone, Shakespeare professor Gary Taylor erroneously established a double authorship of Thomas Decker and Thomas Middleton, which becomes only understandable, however, if one sees them as two of the many pseudonyms, of the same poet genius. Then the highly satirical epistle, as the first part, in prose, gets a meaning. Who, in 1604, was the author from Gravesend. Who else, than the self-confident, haughty, allegedly dead Marlowe could be meant? In a dedication to himself? Characterizing himself as follows. In the despite of all. In never dying dishonor. The gracious. The munificent. The golden rewarder of rhymes. The paymaster of the sonnets the surveyor of the heroical poems, the chief rent gatherer of poets, the valiant confounder of debts, the comfort of all honest Christians, the supper maker to player boys. Consider, that the ambiguous title word, Gravesend, can be related to Marlowe's vanishing point, Gravesend, in Kent, at the River Thames between London and his home town Canterbury as well as to the death consequences of the plague, which, at that time brought about a closure of the theatres in London over a year. It also must cause a thoughtful person, to think about the author of the merry tales of the cobbler of Canterbury, as he passed from Billingsgate to Gravesend, in 1614. Remember that Marlowe was a son of a cobbler from Canterbury. The fastest and most convenient way to travel home from London to Canterbury, was down river, by boat, from Billingsgate to Gravesend. And it even needs a more thoughtful and deeper analysis of the sophisticated poetical tales of the anonymous author of, The Tinker of Turvey, in 1630 with a highly ambiguous subtitle, His Merry Pastime in his passing from Billingsgate to Gravesend. With different characters as tale-tellers such as a tinker, an itinerant beggar or trader, a cobbler, a scholar alias Roland etc., without any doubt, all representing different character and life aspects of the anonymous author himself, Marlowe. The Marlowe Shakespeare authorship thesis assumes, that Marlowe wrote under a multiplicity of pseudonyms and signatures, such as Peel, Shakespeare, Haywood, Davis, and others. This thesis requires, in order to be true, the acceptance, that Marlowe's literary capacity must have been exceptionally high and surpassed contemporary writers by far, on a barely imaginable scale. To some extent, we can extract this assumption from the epistle, in News from Gravesend. Here, the anonymous author formulates, Considering that one London occupier, that's him, Marlowe, dealing uprightly with all men, puts up more in a week, than seven bachelors of art, that every day go barely a wooing to them, do in a year. Let's repeat that. Our poet genius is able to write in a week, what seven bachelor do in a year. The second part of, News from Gravesend, is an impressive poetical essay, in octosyllabic couplets, on the plague and the need for a reformation of the social system for mutual assistance, to enable cities, to tackle emergencies like the plague more humanely. Let's finally read and listen to nobody's witty epilogue. Can you imagine, 
that the author was somebody else, with an ill name, alias Shakespeare, the nobody, with a lost identity and name, alias Marlowe. The Epilogue Here, if you wonder why the King Elidurus bestows nothing on me, for all my good services in his land, if the multitude should say he has preferred nobody, somebody or other would say, it were not well done, for, in doing good to nobody, he should beget himself an ill name. Therefore, I will leave my suit to him, and turn to you. Kind gentlemen, if anybody here dislike nobody, then I hope everybody have pleased you, for being offended with nobody, not anybody can find himself or grieved. Gentlemen, they have a cold suit, that has nobody to speak in their cause, and therefore blame us not to fear. Yet our comfort is this, if nobody has offended, you cannot blame nobody for it, or rather we will find somebody hereafter, shall make good the fault, that nobody hath done, and so, I crave the general grace of everybody.